Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel, Innovate or Reinvent. We've got some really fantastic panelists here who are sort of working at um, different points along that spectrum of innovating or reinventing. So why don't we just start with having each of you describe like what it is you do. Amber, do you want to begin? Sure, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Amber Balde. I'm co-founder and CEO of Clover at this point. Um, previously, uh, ran JP Morgan's blockchain program. And uh, as over the course of, of that entire journey, uh, realized just the large gap between um, what people think blockchain applications should be doing, um, what people are expecting out of uh, crypto uh, sorts of applications, and what you can really do. So um, it is kind of the decision, do we uh, reinvent or do something in a greenfield kind of way that we're working on at Clover, building tools to be able to actually build those next generation applications. Lily. Um, sure, my name is Lily Liu, uh, co-founder and CFO of Earn.com, which we recently um, sold to Coinbase. Uh, and so over the last few years, a um, uh, company was previously called Something 21, um, was pretty early in the space, Bitcoin mining, doing a lot of work on the hardware side. And so as the space kind of evolved, we also evolved with it. Uh, and eventually sort of turned into this platform, Earn.com, that was quite successful, is quite successful um, in helping uh, get cryptocurrency uh, into the hands of many people just through something you do every day, which is responding to messages um, and doing other sort of tasks on the internet. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Rosek. I'm co-founder and chairman of Block. We're a blockchain technology company. Uh, we do two things. We engage with enterprises with our suite of software, and then we also, through Block Labs, uh, we build new decentralized networks and applications. So we're builders and, and plumbers in this space. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this spectrum, innovate to reinvent. And in a pre-panel phone call, Matt Rozak also threw out Disrupt. So why don't we talk about like where it is that you guys feel like your services fall along that spectrum and what those words mean to you? I think uh, depending on the, the market, right, uh, wh whether um, in the enterprise space broadly defined, uh, for, for us, we, we engage with some of the biggest companies in the world, so let's we'll just say Fortune 50, and then um, uh, we also engage with this new enterprise customer that's emerged in the space called the Crypto 50. So, you know, uh, some of the biggest miners and payment processors and wallets and, and other players. Uh, and what's interesting with this Crypto 50 customer that's, that's uh, surfaced on this landscape is they uh, individually have more budget than probably all my enterprise customers combined for this space. Uh, and they, they make uh, more decisive uh, kind of decisions in, in terms of how they want to uh, engage in, in these networks and these tokenized economies. Uh, and it's interesting to watch both of them. I think over time, they wind up um, connecting in a particular way. Um, uh, you see the flight path of traditional enterprise wanting to connect with these, with these networks, and these networks wanting to connect with enterprise. So we're starting to see that fabric and that scaffolding kind of uh, uh, get developed in, in real time. But, uh, but traditional enterprise regulated public companies are still, uh, mind you, in the tokenized economies, uh, are still having um, issues on how to take a bite of that apple. You know, the regulatory frameworks uh, aren't as great, uh, a lack of clarity there. That's improving slowly but surely, but it's, uh, that's where I think the enterprise innovation kind of gets uh, stymied a bit. Uh, but as regulatory clarity develops, I think that, uh, that accelerates. Um, so I think that, um, you know, thus far in cryptocurrency, we had a fantastic year in 2017, brought a lot of new energy and a lot of new people into the space. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, like you know, non-crypto technology, uh, it's important that to really gain adoption for whatever it is you're building, um, it's got to be 10x better, right? The speculative use case has obviously worked that way because people are making 10x returns, but they'd be making in more traditional markets. And I think that uh, as people think about new use cases, you know, whether it's been, you know, remittance that people have been talking about for a while or sort of new consumer use cases that are coming uh, into the market now, you've really got to think about um, what is the value proposition to the end user, right? In the enterprise situation, how does it actually make their lives 10x better or substantially better? And also in the consumer world, is it 10x easier to use, right? Um, is it faster to, to, uh, to sort of uh, to take on an activity that maybe um, you couldn't do in the regular tech, uh, technology world? So I think that's something that we have to keep in mind um, and as we're, as we're building out these new experiences. 
Yeah, I, I think that what people struggle with is um, that in order to drive adoption or usage of something new, it needs to be not only as good as the thing that you're using, but hopefully, you know, 10 times better. Um, and so if you're doing something that's truly greenfield and therefore there is no other alternative, it can be hard to use, and that's okay. People will figure out how, how to struggle through a bad user experience for some period of time um, until that becomes a competitive disadvantage for your product. But when you're trying to transform something that's an existing market, uh, the bar is very high, and I, I think you're completely right about the enterprise budget kind of a thing. It's not coming out of, of this being a full business model, like uh, you live or die based on this project working. It's like, well, let's pull this out of our innovation budget and see if it works. Um, and so that's, you know, I think it results in a lot of uh, a slower progression than people expect uh, for moving things into production. Yeah, so let's talk about that because I think something that's so interesting is like, basically when we say innovate or reinvent, what we're talking about is like the incumbents versus these disruptors, which are, you know, more like the crypto 50, right? This new area of crypto finance that we see being developed. And I'm just so curious because it sounds like in a certain way the incumbents are, um, they have like more restrictions on them or something. So can you talk a little bit about like what the difference is that you're seeing and how you think that's gonna play out? Because like frankly, when I look at this race between like enterprise versus public blockchains, I just feel like the public blockchains are gonna, they're gonna win. And granted like obviously scaling is like such, such a problem. There's a lot of technical problems, but like when something hits there, it takes off so fast. And I, I just don't know if I'm seeing that on the enterprise side. I mean, I, I still think that the breakdown of saying enterprise means permission, means centralized, means why didn't you just need to use a database versus public is somehow proletariat and decentralized and magically therefore good um, is just a, a false dichotomy. And that we should be looking at this as more of like just technical boundaries around information sets and incentivized actors um, and connecting them in more logical ways. Uh, in that way, you can be using public blockchains more as a coordination layer uh, between other kind of networks. You see people experimenting with side and stuff, so I think that's gonna work itself out. Um, but from the enterprise uh, side, they, they will continue, um, it's not that businesses don't understand the technology, and it's not even that they can't innovate and come up with new products, but I think you're right, they need to sit on the sidelines more um, because they have a, an existing business to lose if they make a regulatory misstep. So they're not going to ask for forgiveness. Um, they need to wait and get permission. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I, I think there's two things going on. One is uh, public regulated businesses don't just jump to innovation. They've got this, you know, historical uh, staircase that they go on and they try and reduce costs, they try and grow, and then they try and innovate. And we, we saw this with the early internet, with intranets and extranets. We saw this with cloud, with hybrid clouds. Same thing is happening with blockchains where they're doing some permission ledger work and that exercise, that toe in the water gets them, you know, these big organizations get them uh, a little bit more educated on what this technology is, what it isn't, how to apply it. And that's, that's really important uh, kind of staircasing for them. Uh, part one, part two, what's interesting, and it's not necessarily good or bad or, or um, that this, this dichotomy that's happening, but uh, over time, um, permissionless networks will always win and, and when I say win, that means they will get the hearts and minds of developers. So the best developers will want to innovate and build on open permissionless networks. We saw that with the internet, we saw that we're seeing that now with uh, Bitcoin and crypto. And so, um, uh, but that doesn't mean it's, it's uh, one or the other. I think it's, it's uh, you know, the, the regulatory dynamics, the adoption curves, the form factors for a lot of th things we're doing in this space isn't uh, you know enterprise ready today, and so but that that's that changes every day. Um, so I think that there might be a third party in um, this dichotomy of uh, that we should pay attention to, and that's actually the sovereign states. Uh, I think that um, you know we oftentimes talk about public chains versus private chains, and it's kind of enterprise versus sort of the community owned public chains. And I think uh, the presumption in there is that if it's a public permissionless blockchain, that it's going to be community owned, it's going to be open source, and it's sort of going to be peer to peer, and all those things that we've seen happen with Bitcoin. Um, but I think you've started to see uh, inklings of. Uh, nation states actually becoming quite interested in this. And so we saw maybe an early example with the Petro, which may or may not be um, uh, a sort of long-term uh, long coin out there. But there are countries out there that um, are very interested in perhaps putting together, you know, basically digitizing their national currency, right? 
uh, and, and be able, being able to at once have reserve currency around the world and also have capital controls at home, for example. Uh, and, uh, and that, to me, I think is very relevant uh, because if you think about the nation states and countries out there, they have distribution, right? They have hundreds of millions, if not over a billion people, that they, they can basically, you know, almost instantly turn on identity on a blockchain, for example. And they have all the infrastructure and all of the, all of the resources to really do that. Um, and so I think that's something that we should pay attention to. Uh, and as we think about, you know, permissionless blockchains and we think about growing communities, um, you know, I think it's great that we probably increase the number of people in uh, who maybe hold Ethereum or Bitcoin to somewhere, I'm guessing, around the mid or the high eight figures. But if you think about that in um, either sort of overall internet adoption terms, we've still got a long way to go. And if you think about that in comparison to the ability to scale, let's say, in a social network or a, you know, just through a nation state, I think we've also got a long way to go. Yeah, we're, we continually, we're like bogged down in this commodity, security, cash, regulatory kind of thing that's treating these um, crypto pro products as just a private sector issue in the United States. And it's, I think you're completely right that that's really the wrong way to look at it. If we're thinking of, of public blockchains more as a, um, a public shared commodity and good, we should be thinking of it more like the internet. And um, we really take for granted how much uh, America has benefited from so much of the underlying internet infrastructure um, being developed here in the West. And it's absolutely a method of soft power projection. And that's why we see a lot of um, technical investment from countries that would like to kind of push back on that dominance. Yeah, I actually want to tie together a few different things that you guys said because I think there, there was just so much in there I wanted to ask about. But um, so first, I wanted to ask like if you guys feel like the regulations that, um, especially the incumbents, have to abide by if that's kind of like a hindrance on them when it comes to uh, this competition. But then in the same regard, if that could like lead to what Lily was talking about with how in a way like, you know, public blockchains, crypto assets, they could down the line pose a threat to governments, to central banks that are trying to issue fiat money. And so in that regard, do you think that there's, I mean, granted this sort of imposes this kind of like, um, I don't, it, it makes it seem like the government is just like one entity that is, you know, trying to impose its will. But I just wonder if like that could play out in some regard, if like governments might try to use regulation to keep the upper hand when it comes to the crypto space? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, gov the government isn't just one thing, right? We, right. And we see different um, sentiments come out of different parts, of, especially out of these different kind of committee hearings. There's different, um, they, they take different tones and where one sounds more bullish and other sounds more bearish on it. Um, and, you know, I think they're, they're trying to figure out what the, the right size approach looks like, but they're very, very concerned with um, law enforcement and preventing bad activity. Um, and until there's some sort of, answer for that, it's going to look like chokeholds on the ent entry points and uh, egress points um, in and out of, of the um, open marketplace. And, and I also, um, uh, I, I agree, I, I think that's where they're going to focus their time and, and energy, but th this industry is moving way faster than they could keep up with, and it's constantly changing, and it doesn't fit any rubric or any, any uh, uh, laws or, or fabrics that they're, that they're familiar with. And, and like even in the U.S., uh, less than 3% of the members of Congress have any technical background. So, so the whole dynamic uh, is, is not in our favor to get, you know, kind of these, these, uh, these great red carpet um, uh, regulations to, to, to build in, in this space. What we're, we're going to see is pockets develop and this regulatory arbitrage thing kind of really play out. Uh, uh, there's a crypto congressman here uh, at the conference, Jason from uh, Taipei who's building out this really robust regulatory framework to bring in jobs, innovation, and money. We're going to see that play out uh, all over the world. We've seen that in Gibraltar and Malta and uh, Barbados and uh, even Singapore and Switzerland. And w it, I think regulators uh, here are going to look at that. And, and once kind of this, this market trickles into a trillion, punches through a trillion or a, a couple trillion, I think that's when they'll take it a little bit more seriously in terms of how to um, uh, uh, kind of react uh, and, and build uh, that innovation and keep those jobs in, uh, here. Uh, but until that kind of happens, I, th I still think uh, most regulators um, uh, don't, don't really understand this to, to, to the point that um, 
they want to uh, promote a, a particular regulatory piece here in the U.S. So it's still uh, uh, still very early in that, that regard. Yeah, well, actually, Amber, I wanted to ask you about that because you testified in front of the Ag Committee, um, was it two days ago? Or? I guess so, yeah. Yeah. I've lost track of time at this point where right. I am. So we were just laughing backstage because it turns out that it is the agricultural community that actually regulates this kind of thing because crypto assets are a commodity. I know it seems like super counterintuitive, but... It's like farms, pork bellies, CFTC, crypto. Right, <laughs> exactly. So it's just curious, like, what your impression was from that day because, like, you know, what he was talking about with Taiwan, like, I think is really interesting. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of, um, like, opening of arms from Switzerland, Malta, Gibraltar, Singapore. So where would you, you know, what was your impression from that day? And then uh, if any of you want to jump in as to where the U.S. kind of like falls in terms of this regulatory arbitrage we're seeing. Um, it, it, some people are more open-minded than others, um, which is natural. Uh, there are a few people that seem like they've kind of already made up their minds um, and are just very concerned about the protectionism, kind of uh, money laundering, terrorist financing stuff, um, and won't really consider anything else until that's worked out. Um, but uh, otherwise, it feels like people are trying to really understand. Um, that said, I think most of the work of legislation is done more at the staffer level than at the actual um, congressional level. And there's a real, uh, or representative level, there, there's a real um, understanding standing and kind of momentum there among staffers uh, that they, they want to get it right and kind of move this stuff forward. So even though it kind of feels like ping pong back and forth of uh, is it good, is it bad on a, a given day, the, just the fact that there were like literally there were two committee meetings on the same day, like there's so many, um, so, so much attention being given to this now that it, it seems like it is moving forward um, more quickly than previously. Cool. I mean, a lot of us, on? you know, when, when we um, uh, think about, you know, building, investing, and hiring, uh, we want to spend all our time doing that. But I think um, if you care deeply about the space, you do need to engage with regulators. You need, do need to educate them. Um, I also serve as chairman of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, largest trade association in the space. And uh, we're putting out a white paper in the next week or two uh, on responsible token issuances and actually a guide for both practitioners in the space and policymakers to actually have a framework and start setting some best practices and, uh, and, and guidelines, uh, not necessarily a, a self-regulatory organization, but uh, to up our game in the space, you know, to be more responsible in disclosures and lockups and kind of more uh, traditional things like that. Yeah. Um, and for all of the regulatory arbitrage that is happening, I think it's a good tension between having some of these smaller jurisdictions see this as really an opportunity to, uh, to be a part of this uh, rapidly growing economy. Uh, but at the same time, we do have to recognize that um, the United States, we have some of the deepest talent, um, some, of the de some of the deepest sort of pocket investors, and we are a very critical part of the ecosystem, right? Uh, and so uh, what I see as being very encouraging is that there is a lot of sort of innovation in uh, and, you know, thought about engaging with uh, different jurisdictions, and that actually does create uh, kind of the, the energy to also move some of the larger markets. So since we sort of got into, you know, what you were saying about how you're going to be releasing this um, best practices document, I imagine there are probably some entrepreneurs here in this space who are trying to figure out, oh, like, I'm really interested in this. How do I start working? Where should I start working? So you guys are all, you know, in various ventures in this space. How should people think about it? Like, what questions should they ask? Um, you know, depending on the answers, which way should that guide them? Like, you know, what, what are some factors to think about when an entrepreneur wants to um, enter the space or, or like, or maybe even pivot an existing uh, project or company? Oh, well, for an entrepreneur attempting to enter the space, I mean, I don't think the questions are probably any different than for other sectors. Uh, you want to talk about founder market fit? You know, do you know the market that you're trying to go into? Do you have the relationships to drive um, clients into your product? Or how do you plan on growing that sort of adoption of what you're building? I mean, it's really no different than, than anything else. Um, if, we're, if you're trying to build enterprise businesses, it's important to have enterprise relationships. Uh, and, you know, I think the 2015-2016 the range of the hundreds of we're going to go build a blockchain for business um, kind of 
people that went out there that now you don't hear very much from uh, demonstrated that you can't just walk in with technical knowledge and assume that you're going to solve someone's business problem. You need although, to actually understand the industry. <laughs> although a number of those companies are pivoting to pure crypto now. I don't know yeah. if you noticed that there were a bunch of those this year. Yeah. Um, but, but like more to the point, you know, like if, so let's say you do want to work in this business, but you're sort of trying to figure out, oh, like, you know, should I use this technology to just innovate, like to upgrade existing services, or should I create something brand new, like how should an entrepreneur kind of think about this? I mean, the way that we're thinking about this at, at Clover is that right now, businesses are trying to figure out what's a blockchain use case. And you can't get people away from that right now. That's the question that they want to ask. Is a blockchain good for this? But if you suss out the underlying pieces of what makes something blockchain-y, <laughs> whether that's you know, a distributed systems kind of, is it, is it a shared consensus mechanism? Is it a cryptographic audit log? Is it, there's a lot of different pieces that can be useful to solve little problems that really um, driving developer adoption is just about getting somebody to pick up your tool to solve a problem that they have. And that organically um, turns into things that can be connected to each other in a more multiplayer way, where you don't have to do a $20 million lift replatform. Um, it's kind of a tail wagging the dog right now. And I think that, that'll change as a lot of these initial Initial POCs um, don't go very far. Well, actually, something else I want to ask about is we're seeing all these new um, teams starting up, starting decentralized projects. How does that differ from doing a traditional startup? Uh, what I think is different about it is, uh, you know, if you think about um, you know, some of the some of the uh, instances of value creation more recently in the non-crypto tech world. So Uber uh, probably employs thousands of people, um, created about let's call it about 50 billion of value uh, over the course of seven or eight years, right? Um, on the other hand, in uh, the crypto world, Ethereum went basically zero to 50 billion um, in about three years and employs, you know, maybe. 15 people, something like that, if you're just talking about the Ethereum Foundation. So what it means is that um, you rely much more on the community to create value, which means that um, your community is comprised of people who you know, maybe just passively hold the token to people who work full-time as a developer building applications on Ethereum, right? And so you have to find a way to engage with and motivate um, and you know, bring in uh, people who are all the way for, uh, everywhere along that spectrum. Um, and I think that that's a very different type of community engagement that is relevant in crypto, um, which, uh, which differs from just building a, a normal tech company, right? Because essentially, this is your sort of distributed workforce, but they don't report to you. And some of them might only spend a minute a month checking their balance with Ethereum, and some people might spend you know, 80 hours a week working. So how do you uh, engage with such a, such a disparate uh, community of engagement of skill set of interest? Yeah, I think this is a really important point. Um, in building these decentralized networks, uh, this community dynamic is a thing. Uh, we saw that where, where, um, where Ethereum really developed this community of developers. Um, and, and there's no shortage of Ethereum killers out there now. EOS, Tezos, Quantum, uh, you name it. And the question I have is, is how those developers are going to be either inspired or incentivized to move like a you know, a, f a flock of birds or bees from one protocol to another, you know, whether they're tribal and it's like, hey, I, I learned Ethereum and, uh, you know, I wear Ethereum colors or uh, am I going to skip over to a new rail? And that'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next several years, whether people are going to be entrenched and saying, hey, uh, this, is, this is my rail and, and I'm really particular because I'm, you know, I'm tribal, you know, I like the whatever, uh, Golden State Warriors and I hate the Bulls or vice versa or whatever. Um, well, you're supposed to carve out some VC fund out of your $4 billion and then subsidize developers to come and try out their projects, right? <laughs> I'm sure that's going to stick. Yeah, those, those are, I mean, those are, I mean, no, I mean, in, in reality, we're seeing um, lots of networks build a, 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 a side pocket of a billion dollars uh, to, to uh, venture invest into everybody's project <laughs> and, and see, see what happens uh, through, through sunlight and water on, on the things that uh, are starting to sprout. Um, and that's, that's just a... Uh, a more aggressive community, yeah. you know, developing development uh, fund. Um, airdrops are ridiculous. I think uh, I, I love to see smarter airdrops to build these communities with, you know, like airdrops with with conditions. Um, but I think all these are hacks to try and build these communities. It'll, it'll be interesting yeah. to see how that plays out. We'll see how tribal or mercenary people are. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's a good note for us to end on. It sounds like if you get into this, you'll have to do some community organizing, a la Barack Obama. Um, but anyway, thank you all so much for coming on the show, and thanks for all, uh, for all, to all of you for attending. Thanks.